This video is not about women. It's about this. There is a shift happening today. Do you see it? What is this shift? What is it shifting to? And what is it shifting away from? There is a strange spirit moving among us today, and it seems to be moving in the hearts of women For this spirit is a woman, and she is calling you to rise. She sits among us today, whispering in the ears of anyone who will listen. She may be in the choir, in the prayer group, Bible study, or Sunday school class. She is loved and accepted by almost everyone. She terrifies the old guard because she refuses to bow to the man-made preferences of the legalistic patriarchy of the past. They despise her. But why? She's no real threat to you. But she is a threat to the old ways. She is a threat to those whose outdated theological positions prevent us from the progress that we desperately need today. She calls you to challenge these gatekeepers. Embrace your power. Unleash your inner goddess. Submit no longer. Rise, she says. Throw off this system that demeans you. Throw off these chains. Break free from this box. And do not live one more day in this bondage. Be free, she says. Ignore the cries of the gatekeepers whose old ways and old positions keep you from rising. Do not let these outdated rules tame you or hold you down. Be loved, she says. You deserve this. You deserve more. It's time to rise. In the past, she was called many things. A troublemaker, a heretic, a witch, and even a Jezebel. But this, this is a new day. Tomorrow, she will be a leader. And she calls the shots now. She's going to give a new set of rules for a new world. Justice will now be social not spiritual. And she will rise to be equal. She will tear down the walls that divide us. She will tear down the walls that keep us from our desires. No more control. She has many names. Kundalini, Shekinah, Gaia, the Mother of Light, Shambhala, Sophia, the Lady, and some even call her Holy Spirit. Her time has come.
she will be silent no more. She is rising. We let our hearts rise above our minds tonight. We get out of our boxes and we allow you to move. In February of 2020, we were able to release a documentary on YouTube called Third Adam. And in that documentary, we explain to you how the all of the religions of the world were going to find common ground and come together as a one world religion. We have covered all of these groups and who they are. We've dealt with Satan, Eastern religions, the occult, entertainment, false churches, the NAR, and all these other groups. Here's the main point of this entire video, and this is where people are going to get offended. But all of these groups here, all of them, are the same thing with different labels. That's what they are. This and this and this and this and this are the same thing. They are the same poison with a different label on the bottle. But it's all the same. They are the same thing. Their author is the same. Their fruit is the same. The practices are the same. They are the same thing. That's what they are. And when these groups all come together and unite as one, they're going to usher in a world leader and they're going to declare him to be God and he's going to have signs and wonders and power and they're all going to worship him and they're all going to take that mark in their forehead. And that through this great merger of all religions, there would come forth a man who would be the head of all this and he would be called the Antichrist and we have given him the term the third Adam because he will be claiming to be God himself. And we made our case in that video explaining how we believe that the world is perfectly primed and prepared right now for something like that to transpire. And then on June 6th of 2020, we released Third Adam 2, The Great Seduction. And we explained to you how that this great religious gathering, which the Bible calls the Whore of Babylon, the one world religion, how that it would seduce others to yoking up with it, and that experience and even music would be the glue that bound everyone together. It's going to be none other than the New Apostolic Reformation. It's going to be your Bethel. It's going to be Hillsong. It's going to be all these compromising new evangelical people. Now, most people would say, you know, Spencer, how in the world are all these denominations going to work with Roman Catholicism? How is that even possible? Well, if you look at their doctrinal statement on paper, it's not possible. It never has been possible. What is the thing that unites these people? It's going to have to be experience. And in order to unite around experience, you have to throw doctrine to the wind just for the sake of unity. They're all going to unite around a generic form of worship, worshiping a generic deity, saying love, grace, hope. And it's going to be this soft, unconditional love, like a mother's love. And we went all the way back to Nimrod in the book of Genesis and we explained to you how that this has always been Satan's goal is to unite the world together. And the Tower of Babel was one of those examples of that trying to happen. We showed you how that many times through history Satan has tried to play the same game from a different angle. Bring the world together and unite the world. The truth is yes, 
all false religions, if you follow them upstream, the fountainhead of all of those religions is Mystery Babylon. Genesis chapter 11 is where all of these false religions began. The only exceptions that do not have their foundation in Mystery Babylon are Christianity and Judaism. And so there's going to come a day where all of these religious people are going to realize what I'm telling you in this video, that yes, we all have the same source. And we showed you that there was a mystery religion that we're calling the Mystery of Babylon. And this religion has always existed throughout the Old Testament. And that this religion somehow finds a way to worship a female deity. We showed you the pagan trinity of Nimrod, Semiramis, and Tammuz. And we showed you how that in paganism, there's always an emphasis on the Great Mother and the Divine Son. And we even showed you how that this transcended so many different cultures throughout all of history. And although the names were different, it was still basically the same religion. It was goddess worship. And when it comes to studying these religions, and there's so many of them, the difficulty is, is that it is so complex and it's always evolving and always changing. So if you find this religion and you identify it today, well, tomorrow it's going to reinvent itself. And so you have to go through all the work again and re-identify this religion. And it can be a very difficult thing to do if you're not a discerning person. And we have done a tremendous amount of research trying to go through volumes of religious documents through history, uh, through theology studies, and just trying to identify this. And thankfully, we have been able to whittle it down to just a few core principles that we want to give to you to help you identify this mystery religion. Now, everybody has got to understand that there are not hundreds and thousands of different religions in the world. The truth is, there are only two religions in the world. Bible-believing Christianity and Mystery Babylon. That's it. It's just that simple. And as we dig into these principles and these truths, we pray that you would have an open mind and an open heart. There's a lot of things here that are very heavy. And there are things in this documentary that could change your life and change the way you see the world forever. This video is instructional and educational in nature, but it also is a dreadful warning for those who are going down the wrong road. There are demonic, deceptive forces at work now that are so masterfully crafted, so unbelievably clever, that even the Bible says that if it were possible, it would deceive the very elect. We want to shed light on this deception. And God is calling you out of this darkness and into His marvelous light. The truths we will speak about here are not a game. Your very soul could be at stake. Rise up. I think part of what we're seeing is actually the rise of a form of female totalitarianism. So we have no idea what totalitarianism would be like if women ran it, because that's never happened before in the history of the planet. And so we've introduced women into the political sphere radically over the last 50 years. We have no idea what the consequence of that is going to be.
I couldn't go into to things that, that dealt with medicine. I couldn't go into law. I couldn't go into the real professions. It was extremely limiting. And of course, the overall goal was to find a husband, um, get married, have children, and live with a white picket fence. Now, I'm not an old man, but I've had the opportunity to speak to several old people through the years. And many of them basically say the same thing, that this is not the world that I grew up in. No doubt, I mean, the world changes, technology changes, times change, and I, we all understand that. But the changes that I'm seeing that are happening today are different. It's, it's not something that technology is progressing, is that the very belief structures that people have held to for so long in this country are eroding away. And there are so many people out there today that are advocating for what they call change. And there's a lot of people out there today in the political world that are calling for what they say is progress. That women's progress is human progress. And human progress is women's progress once and for all. And she knows that to change the world, you need to change the idea of power. So the question has to be asked, what is this change that they want? What, what is this progress that they want? And what is this shift that they're trying to accomplish? What is it shifting to? And probably more importantly, what is it shifting away from? We can take our witchery back. We can take our sisterhood back. And most importantly, our personal sovereignty. These movements generate changes in policy that signal a true shift in international attitudes and practice towards equal rights. And many of them are saying that, okay, men are dominating women. Men are ahead of women. Men are, are cheating women out of their fair share of money or positions or whatever. Justice is about how much ladies get paid. And we're going to change that, and they're calling this progress. And certainly, I have noticed, just as you have, that there's a number of women that are holding prominent positions in political power today. Uh, there's more women CEOs, more, more women athletes that are getting all the attention. This is our time. And prevails. My job in all this is to try to find the religious connection. What is the theological views of people that is causing them to believe this political ideology or even this social ideology that they hold to? What is the theological roots of this? And why do these people have such a just disdain for the Bible? I can't believe in a faith that treats me as a second-class citizen, placing limitations of stained glass ceilings upon half of humanity, holding us back based on gender. And I've been doing lots of digging, lots of research, and I'm going to tell you, it's not good. Now, the Bible teaches something that is commonly called complementarianism, which is the idea that men and women are equal in value but they just have different gifts and have different roles to play in society and in the church and in the home. It does not mean that one is better than the other or more valuable than the other. That's absurd. Nobody who believes the Bible preaches that. But we do understand from looking at the Bible that men are given a different task than women, and women are given a different task than men. And this goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden, where the Bible says, man and woman created he them. And a good analogy to understand this is the military analogy. Now, the United States military has several branches, but I'll just give you four of them. I mean, you have the Army, the Air Force, the Navy, and the Marines. They're all equally valuable because they all do something that is vital. It's just different. Now, the Air Force is a very valuable tool to have when you're fighting a war, but the Air Force by itself really is not complete. It's, it's not enough to do the entire job just by itself. And the same with the Navy. The Navy has a huge role to play. 
in warfare and getting troops to locations and things like that. But by itself, the Navy is not going to be able to do everything that needs to be done. And if you have a great well-trained army and a great well-trained Marine Corps, and you don't have an Air Force to cover them or a Navy to transport them, uh, then you, you just don't have all the tools that you need to get every job done. You are not a fully furnished military force. You've got to have all facets of it working together. And none is more vital or more important than the other, but they, they all complement each other, if you will. And that's really the best illustration I give you of complementarianism. And in the roles of men and women, men need women and women need men. And we complement each other. And we all have different roles that we have to play and, and fulfill. And that's how God has designed the world to be. But the shift that I'm seeing is away from complementarianism or commonly known as like traditional gender roles into something called egalitarianism. I mean, we are capable of being more than just eye candy. The audiences are embracing and even asking for, begging for really strong female superheroes. So let's get some diversity rising up. And the cry today is that women should not be held back from any position of power or any paycheck or anything like that because of their gender. And the war cry today is that women can do anything a man can do. And why is this call for a shift always somehow connected to women? Why are the groups that are running these organizations almost exclusively women? And why, when these groups organize publicly, that it is largely made up of angry, hateful, crude, and lewd, and wicked women? Fight for the right to be free, to be who we are, to be equal. And the question that I want to propose to you when we see these things, and I'm sure that everybody sees this, is that that is the effect. That's what we're seeing. But what is the cause? Why is this happening? Could there be some religious theological view or maybe even a spirituality that is causing this to happen? And if so, if there is a theological view or a spirituality or even a spirit that is causing this shift, then is that spirit of God or is it from somewhere else? And why is it that the men that are involved with it, they take on kind of a Jezebel Ahab dynamic where she's in charge, she's the angry one, she's the wicked one, and he's just kind of like the spineless wicked guy who just goes along with whatever she says. Joe Biden knows a stronger America is one that works for women. And women largely on a scale never seen before are being called to rise up and throw off this system that we now live in. And it's happening to a degree and on such a large scale such as has never been seen before. The serpent is here to get you to rise, to rise, to get you to see beyond what you've been told. The serpent is the spirit of the divine feminine energy. For any man to successfully enter into a warfare, he has to understand his enemy. And our enemy is Satan. There's no doubt about that. And so to understand his tactics, we have to go back and look at his track record. How does Satan work? And I fear that most people today are unwilling to objectively evaluate his tactics because 
they could find something that's not necessarily politically correct. And so let's just go see what the Bible actually has to say. And so here in the garden you have the woman, you have the man, and you have animals, and you have plants. Now, if you've ever seen those videos where people set up these thousands of dominoes and they set it up in some elaborate design, all of that comes down because they flick one domino over and the whole thing comes down. And a lot of people have done a lot of interesting videos on that. But in a sense, Satan did the same thing when he looked at the Garden of Eden and he said, what is the one thing that I can attack that will take down everything? Well, Satan chose to go after the woman because he knew if he got the woman, then he got everything and the whole entirety of creation fell that day. And so whatever you believe, it doesn't matter. The truth is Satan chose to attack women. And that's not something that's like demeaning to women. Really what that is, that's something that shows the value that women have. And so God comes on the scene and of course he has to judge sin because he's a holy God. And so this is the structure that God set up after the fall. Now we understand that Satan loves to go after women. That is his favorite tactic. So what did God do? God put a godly man between Satan and the woman. And so now if Satan wants to go after women, there is a safeguard in place now to defend her from the attack of Satan. And it's the godly husband. Now many people today look at this structure here that God created and said that this is demeaning to women and those who reject Christianity, they would call this patriarchy. In the simplest terms, patriarchy is a social system that values masculinity over femininity. This type of social system dictates that men are entitled to be in charge and dominate women. So patriarchy is a society or institution marked by the supremacy of the father. And the truth is, is God is good. And this is not some design to oppress women. This is a design to protect women. And the reason is, is because this entity right here is always trying to go after that entity right there. That's his favorite tactic. That's what he's always trying to do. And Satan knows that if he can get her, then he can get everybody. This is a consistent theme all throughout the Bible. And really this whole concept does not demean women in the slightest. This actually shows how vitally important women are. And if women weren't important, then why is Satan going after them like he does? It's because even Satan knows that the woman, if he's got her, then he's got everybody. So my job was to let the court see that these classifications more often put women not on a pedestal, but in a cage. So once Adam and Eve are banished from the garden, they have to go out and start a family and build a life together. And God had an order and a design for the home. And this is what it looked like. Uh, that Christ is the head of the family, of course, and that Christ is head of the man, man is head of the woman, and the woman is the head of the children. And this was God's design. And so if Satan is going to attack the home, he's going to do the same thing he did in the garden. He's going to go after the woman. And so what's happening today is that Satan is going after these women. And he's saying that this whole structure here is demeaning and it is degrading to women and that women should be raised up to the next level. It's a pecking order from the origins of our country uh, to now that certain men would have certain jobs and they all agreed on what the sequence would be. Our planet is being neglected and that's all because the feminine energy has been suppressed. And so what women do oftentimes is they actually reject this whole paradigm, calling it patriarchy and whatever, and they are saying that we need to rise to at least the same level with the man and be equal with the man. Feminism is not trying to take from men, but just trying to raise to the same level as what men have. And just to be clear, 
Being a feminist does not mean that I wish to push down or talk poorly of men. And that ends up looking something like this. And so what happens is, is that women want to break free from this structure. And they want to rise to be what they say is equal with the man. And see, it's the same tactic that Satan used in the garden. He said you could be your own God. And basically he was saying that you're, you're down here, but you could go and be your own God. You could raise up in this system, but because of some structure that you're in, you're being restricted and put down, and you need to rise up. Thousands year old patriarchy that needs to be disposed of and brought into balance. The serpent is here to get you to rise, to rise. We can take our witchery back. And this move from here to here is what is called in the occultic world the rise of the divine feminine. The serpent is the spirit of the divine feminine energy. But the common thread of mystery religion is that they believe in what they call dualities. And basically what they believe is that there's opposite energies in the universe. There's good and bad, light and dark. And by merging these two, they can bring what they call balance or wholeness to their lives. And really in modern pop culture, the most prominent example of this is Star Wars. You have Darth Vader on one side, and he's the dark side. And then you have Luke Skywalker on the other side, he is the light side. And they always talk about trying to bring balance to the Force. Well, where did they get that? Well, they, they got that from Eastern mystical esoteric religions. The Force basically came from uh, you know, distilling all of the uh, religious beliefs, spiritual beliefs, go all around the world, all through time, finding the similarities, and then creating a an easy to hmm. uh, deal with metaphor for what religion is. Another example of this is the yin yang, and this is a very prominent symbol in martial arts. What is that? It's a duality. It's two opposing forces meant to be brought together, merged together to bring balance. And in modern New Age religion, which is just another derivative of esoteric mysticism and the occult, they talk about the divine masculine and the divine feminine. So what you have basically is two opposing worldviews. This one is biblical and this one is esoteric in nature. I want to just give you the difference between the two. This one is God's way and we'll call this order. But the one on this side where the woman rises up and becomes equal with the male, we're going to call this one. You have order and then you have balance. We need this, this balance, this equilibrium, equanimity between the energies. Feminism literally just means you believe in equality of the sexes. And so in the esoteric world, when they're talking about balance, this is what they're speaking of. Because they view man being above woman as an oppression of women or a putting down of women. Masculine energy has been the dominant energy for at least the last 5,000 years. We know of the existence of the goddess energy, the feminine energy, that within each one of us is yin and yang. So there's black and white, there's dark and light in each one of us. And so they want to bring these two into balance. And so this is how they see everything. They see men above women, and they want to rise the feminine 
up to the man so that they're equal and that this duality is made whole. It's not that a man shouldn't be in power. It's not that a woman shouldn't be in power. It's not that one can lead better than the other. It's that the energies within them must be balanced to be good leaders. And really, those who are in this worldview, when they look at the biblical order that God has, this is all they see is that men being above women, and the only reason they give is, okay, he's above me because of his gender, and that's the only thing that they see. A suppression of the goddess and a suppression of the moon. And from their point of view, that does make sense because, I mean, who wants to be under a man just because he's a man? I mean, that nobody would go for that. But here's the part that they're missing. They're missing the fact that this is God's order and that Christ is ahead of the man and the man is ahead of the woman and woman is to be ahead of the children. And this is God's order. And what you have really is a problem with society where you have men who aren't living for Christ and aren't following Christ. And so these women, they see these men, but they don't see Christian men or godly men. They don't even see Christ. And so to them, in their mind, who wants to submit to all these godless men? And quite frankly, I can't blame them. Leaders who are balanced will lead balanced nations. And that's simply not what we have right now. I mean, who wants to submit to a guy just because he's a guy? And so they break out of that and they, they rise up to be equal with the man. And so our God is a God of order. But anytime you hear people talking esoteric talk, they will always use words like balance. And these two are opposing worldviews. Now, when a person breaks free from God's design for life, there are actually unintended consequences there. Now, I want to show you what they are. If you notice here on this side, there's four sections, but on this side, there's only two. What sections are missing? Well, you have Christ and the child are missing. So let's place them down here. In this system, Christ and children belong and they fit. But in this system, they do not. And the truth is, anytime someone goes from here to here, rejecting this format, and they embrace this format, they always end up hating Christ, and they have no use for children. And that's probably why they abort them so much. So what is the rise of the Divine Feminine? Well, it's pretty simple. The rise of the Divine Feminine is a shift in mindset from a biblical worldview to an occultic worldview. It is the rejection of Bible Christianity and a biblical worldview by saying that there's some injustice in this, and they call it patriarchy or whatever, to embrace fully an occultic or satanic worldview. That is the rise of the Divine Feminine. She goes from here, rising up to here. And so what is the Divine Feminine? What does that even mean? And the problem is, is that we as God's people, we think biblically, but we're trying to understand a group of people who don't. And these concepts oftentimes are very foreign to Bible-believing people. It's pretty simple. It is an Eastern mystical concept 
that has to do with masculine energy and feminine energy. Now this is not a biblical concept, this is an esoteric concept. Now as we explained in 3rd Adam 2, mystery religion is always moving, it's always changing and evolving, and it's taking on different names as it goes. It always changes, it's like it's evolving constantly. The occultic world is obsessed with unity and what they call balance. God demands order, but Satan tries to give balance. You see, they say that God divided things in the book of Genesis, and the goal of the occult is to merge back what God has divided. And when these divisions, which what they call are dualities, are brought back together and merged back together, then balance is achieved, and that's that's the whole goal. Some even call it wholeness. You were broken, but now you're put back together. And one thing people really don't understand about the Lord is that God is a divider. He always has been. God is a divider, but Satan is a uniter. Satan's always trying to merge back the things that God has divided. God is a divider. Satan is a uniter. It's just that simple. Now, when we talk about the rise of the Divine Feminine, we understand what that looks like and what people are doing. They're basically rejecting a biblical worldview and going into an esoteric worldview. But we had to kind of really nail down what is the Divine Feminine. And we went through volumes of information, reading stuff from the secular world to psychology to Hinduism to New Age mysticism, and, and just, just, we went through volumes of information. And the tricky part about mystery religion is that it, it's so fluid, it changes all the time, and, you know, five different people will be talking and using five different terms for the same thing, and that's really why it's so difficult to nail down. And when the Divine Feminine rises in these people, there are three universal spiritual attributes that all of them have. And let me show you what these spiritual attributes are. The first universal attribute is that every single one of these people becomes, they become mystical in nature. And true mysticism is not based on any written document. A true mystic hates being bound by any creed or any dogma or any biblical text. Their theological views are shaped by experience rather than creed. God shows up for me in very practical, real ways. You know, like I work, that's how I meet with God. But I didn't love to open the Bible and read the Bible for hours a day. Or I'd go see a cow being born and I would really feel like I experienced God in those moments. I can't wait to see what you're gonna do and where you're gonna take me. There's a whole nother world. There's a whole nother world that we can't see. Take us up tonight, God. Take us up tonight. And really, because it has no universal written creed, that's kind of what makes it difficult to identify. They don't want that. Now, Helena Blavatsky was the leader of a group called the Theosophants, and she started a religion called Theosophy. And one of her disciples was a lady named Alice Bailey. And Alice Bailey is known today as the mother of New Age religion. And Alice Bailey wrote in a book called The Externalization of the Hierarchy. This is what she put in print. She said, therefore, in the new world order, spirituality will supersede theology. Living experience will take the place of theological acceptances. And that sums up beautifully the idea of mysticism, is that they, they absolutely have hatred and disdain for any written dogma, creed, or even the Bible. And they may use the Bible sometimes to prove a point, but when they do, they do it in such an allegorical, mystical sense that their harmonic is so bad, it's, it's almost laughable. The second universal attribute of people whose divine feminine has risen is that they become overwhelmingly 
sensual in nature. Now the basic definition of sensuality is just doing what gratifies your flesh. And when the divine feminine is risen in somebody, they, they are overwhelmingly loving and they're even overwhelmingly positive. But sensuality is a form of love that is detached from truth. And it's self-gratifying and it's self-serving. And really that's one of the things about sensuality is that it's always pretending to be a form of love. But it's not. The type of love that it is, is not in line with how the Bible defines love. I just, I've been so filled with love this year that I just feel completely love drunk. You guys know that lovesick feeling where you can't stop thinking about that certain person. All you feel is bliss, euphoria, paradise, butterflies. I swear you guys, this feeling has never been this intense for me. I'm not speaking religious. Jesus Christ is the lover of every human being's soul. You know what Jesus loves our souls? He loves our souls kind of like a husband loves his bride. People who are sensual in nature are often seeking what feels good instead of what is good. They are literally seeking to gratify their senses. And the only measure that they live by is if it feels good, then it's right. And most people who are into this have morality problems. I'm right on the verge of going and getting the tattoo. You have a moral imperative to, to speak publicly about some of these more controversial issues. No, because we try to be like Jesus. Very rarely did Jesus ever talk about morality or social issues. Alan Watts was an Episcopalian minister and he thought that the rules were too restrictive and they actually kicked him out of the clergy and he ended up renouncing Christianity altogether. And his first wife divorced him, saying that he was just so immoral and so illicit in his lifestyle, there was no way she could stay married to this man. And then you have Helena Blavatsky, and her character was questioned so many times in her life. I mean, she was accused of fraud over and over and over again. And then you have guys like the famous psychologist Carl Jung, who was a practicer of mystical religions. And he was married to the same woman for 52 years, but he actually lived an open marriage. I mean, the man was completely immoral. And the divine feminine has always been characterized by its desire to just do what feels good. And these people despise any forms of holiness. And the way to aggravate these people is to say that there are things that you can't do. There are moral standards by which you must live by. And the mark of the divine feminine is that they are sensual in nature. They are not chasing what is good. They're just chasing what feels good to them. And the final characteristic of a person whose divine feminine has risen is that they become overwhelmingly agreeable. They want to get along with everybody and they don't have any problem with anybody anymore. They're kind of like a hippie where they're just like, man, everything's cool, everything's good, everybody's awesome, everybody's amazing. We love everybody and we want to get along with everybody. Love you too. Bless you. Love you. Love you. Bless you. Even so, Lord Jesus Christ, come quickly. Come now to unify. I believe that the Catholic Church and the Christian Church are going to come together right now. We have far more in common than what divides us. When you talk about Pentecostals, Charismatics, evangelicals, 
uh, fundamentalist, Catholics, Methodist, Baptist, Presbyterian, on, on, and on, and on. And a lot of people look at that and say, what's wrong with that? Well, the problem is, is that it is agreeable of everything, including sin. It won't stand against anything. It has no problem with anybody. It just can get along with anything. The last main characteristic of the Divine Feminine is its calls for agreeableness, or another way to put that is calls for unity. The Divine Feminine can get along with just about anybody, and it welcomes fellowship with any and all. Helena Blavatsky started the Theosophant Society, or the Theosophical Society, and she said this, the chief aim of the Theosophical Society is to reconcile all religions sex, and nation under a common system of ethics based on eternal verities. Now one of the main disciples of Helena Blavatsky was Alice Bailey. And Alice Bailey said this, The new age is upon us, and we are witnessing the birth pains of the new culture and the new civilization. This is now in progress. That which is old and undesirable must go. And these undesirable things, hatred, and the spirit of separation must be the first to go. Because one of our spiritual enemies' greatest strat strategies is to divide, especially when it comes to the family of God. We need bridge builders. We need people who can meet in the middle. Uh, we can have uh, disagreements, but they can be amicable. Like We can have uh, differences in opinion, but we could do it in love. Then, man, we need to be in open dialogue and friendly dialogue with one another. When we stand together in unity of mission, we are unstoppable. Uh, I think that we're going to have to make a real concerted effort to walk in greater unity, to be more gracious to one another. You see that they want to unite. They're an agreeable religion. They want to unite with all things and merge it all together. These divisions don't really help anybody. This is a bad thing. Let's let our walls down, let's all come together, and let's usher in a world of peace and harmony, and let's all get along. So let's ask the question. We see here these are the spiritual components, something that is inside of a person whose divine feminine has risen. But if you've got a group of people that are all this way and they organize a religion, what would be the characteristics of that? When this religion organizes and systematizes itself, there are three chief, easy to identify characteristics. The first one is, Female leadership. Now, of course, the main body of these organized religions is going to be made of male and female, no doubt. But when we get to the top, who's actually running the show? Well, it's, it's women that are running it. Another significant characteristic of this religion when it's organized is not only that it has female leadership, but that it also is that it insists on being free from all boundaries. We don't want to be restrained by that. We don't want any fences. We don't want any rules. We don't want anybody telling us what we can't do. Because those are two things that don't seem like they normally mix very well, at least here, and especially in the Christian circles that I grew up in. 
I want everyone to be able to experience the Beer and Hymns event. There's a real magic that happens here. There's something that happens with the mixing together of just fun music that we all grew up singing and then songs that are just deeply spiritual. And being able to kind of evolve them without taking away from what they are in a new way, we created something that we loved and others loved and the response has just been amazing. I think it sets people free. I think there are a lot of people that grow up in the church with a certain taboo on alcohol. There are none of those uh, feelings like you have to clean yourself up before you walk into this place, and that definitely comes through. They like it that they can come and be themselves and not feel like they have to fit a mold. And when you combine their insistence on having no rules, and you combine it with their sensuality, then they start saying things like, well, God is love. And it doesn't matter what I do. God just looks on my heart. I was brought up Baptist, but educated in Catholic school. But I never really felt him until like the first time I got high and went on a bike ride. <laughs> and if you share with them from the Bible, thou shalt not, then that aggravates them so badly because that goes against their agreeable nature. They just believe everything's okay. And lastly, and this is probably the most disturbing of all, not only do they have female leadership and they demand freedom from all boundaries, but they also worship a female God. I promise you, if you send her the Holy Spirit back, I will not get in the way. These three aspects are the inward aspects of the Divine Feminine. But the female leadership, freedom from boundaries, and the female God, those are the exterior things, the structural things that they put into place that gives them away. This is how you identify these people. Now, I want to remind you again that everything God does, Satan imitates it and infiltrates it. This has been a consistent theme throughout the scriptures, and we can find so many examples of this in history. This mystery of religion that started with Nimrod at the Tower of Babel, which ended up being led by Semiramis, has always evolved and changed but the core principles of it have stayed the same. And one of the earliest examples of this mystery religion imitating Christianity and infiltrating Christianity was something called Gnosticism. And I want to tell you that as I was studying this, I thought to myself, this is the most hellish thing I have ever read in my life. Now let me just sum it up for you very simply what Gnosticism believed. Now, biblical creation is something along the lines of this. We have, this is creation, all of it here. Here's earth with mankind. We have that Lucifer is the God of this world. And so we see that God the Father sent Jesus Christ, His Son, 
down to earth to die on the cross for the sins of mankind to redeem them. And that if mankind will place their faith in this Christ, then they can go to heaven when they die. And all of this is done through something called faith. But Gnostic theology is completely different. The Gnostics believe that there was a female entity called an Aeon that accidentally created the God of the Old Testament and he was called the Demiurge. And that the Demiurge created mankind on this planet here within creation and locked them into this prison. And that Sophia knew that she had to unlock mankind from this prison. And so Sophia sent the light bearer named Lucifer to go down to the Garden of Eden and give them the knowledge of good and evil. The serpent is here to get you to rise, to rise, to get you to see beyond what you've been told. Adam and Eve fell in the garden. They literally were freed from the prison that the Old Testament God, the Demiurge, created for them. So at this point, they had enough light to break free from the Garden of Eden but they didn't really have enough understanding and light to break free from the whole of creation. And so the Abraxas, which was the god that created Sophia, sent an entity named Jesus Christ to the earth to demonstrate a spirituality that they could have so that mankind, by Christ's example, could escape the whole of creation. Now the symbol that is often associated with the Abraxas is a body of a human with the head of a rooster, legs like two serpents, and he's carrying a shield and some sort of flailing instrument. And oftentimes we can find this symbol on buildings and jewelry and stones because they believe this symbol had magical powers to it. And the Abraxas was kind of viewed as the all-powerful God of all gods. Some even say if you, if you take his name and you apply the numbers to his name, it adds up to 365, and that's why we have 365 days in the calendar year. And many historians have suggested that as time went on, the name Abraxas evolved into what we now say is Abracadabra which is often known as a magical incantation. You say abracadabra for protection or for some sort of magic to take place. And actually, if you go back to like the 1200s, you can find the Abraxas symbol on a lot of literature associated with the Knights Templar. Now, when Christ was sent to earth by the Abraxas, he was teaching them a spirituality, an experiential spirituality called Gnosis. Now in 3rd Adam 2, we started at Mystery Babylon in the book of Genesis with Nimrod, Semiramis, and Tammuz, and we went all the way through the Bible. But in 3rd Adam 3, I want to go to the first century. And one of the very first examples of this Mystery Babylon religion was the Gnostics. And that's why we're bringing this up to you. Now, the word Gnosticism is used to describe a number of different people in the very first century and they disagreed amongst themselves about the particulars of their theology. Almost all of these people in this group, their belief system lined up with the divine feminine almost perfectly. All the Gnostics were known for their inclusion of females into the leadership of their ministries. Not only they had female leadership, but they also believed in freedom from boundaries. According to their theology, the God of the Old Testament was the Demiurge, and he was a bad guy. I mean, he was a tyrant. He was evil. And so all those thou shalt nots in the Old Testament were there as like shackles from a prison. And Jesus came to set us free from all that so that all oh, that's just null and void. We, we can just throw all that, all that law stuff out. The Jerusalem Council was saying to the Gentiles, 
You are not accountable to the Ten Commandments. You're not accountable to the Jewish law. We're done with that. God has done something new. Some of you grew up in really religious environments where, you know, God wasn't happy unless you were depressed, you know? Thou shalt not obey the Ten Commandments because those aren't your commandments. Yours are better. It didn't even count as church unless you had to endure it. You need to move on past that. God is doing a new thing. I mean, lift your hands, lift your heart, be free in his presence. Church leaders, the church leaders who were closest to the action, who understood better than we ever will. Church leaders unhitched the church from the worldview, the value system, and the regulations of the Jewish scripture. And now Jesus came to show us a new and living way, and so none of that stuff really matters anymore. All that matters is this spirituality that we experience, this gnosis. And so forget about all that law stuff. Just, man, just have this spiritual experiences and you'll be okay. So they had feminine leadership. They had freedom from all boundaries. And then lastly, they had a female goddess that they worshipped. The Christian Trinity is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And the Gnostics, their trinity or form of that was, of course, you had the Abraxas, which would be the equivalent of God the Father. Then they had Christ, who was uh, God the Son. And the third part of their trinity was Sophia, and she was a woman. Matter of fact, the Gnostics were all the time saying that Sophia was wisdom in the book of Proverbs. And they said that she was the divine wisdom from heaven. And so back in the first century, you have Bible wisdom, and then you have what the Gnostics called their wisdom, which was a woman. Their wisdom was Sophia. And I find it interesting to note that the book of James pins down that there are basically two wisdoms. There is a godly wisdom, and then there's another form of wisdom. And James 3.15 says, This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. That sounds like the divine feminine. Could it be that this verse was put in the Bible to show that there are two wisdoms? One comes from God and the other does not. And matter of fact, one of those wisdoms, even the Bible says it's sensual, which is a mark of the divine feminine. And no matter how absolutely insane this all sounds, this is mystery religion, and it does change throughout time, but the principles we've given you are consistent no matter what name or form it takes. Now from Gnosticism till today, it does seem like there's a pretty clear line of succession of this mystery religion, because although these religions have different names, they all operate by the same principles of the Divine Feminine. From Gnosticism, you have Martianism, which was started by a man named Martian. And it's interesting to note that Polycarp said that Martian was the firstborn of Satan. And the first century Christians hated this religion. And then from Martianism, you have Manichaeism, which was a merger of Zoroastrianism and biblical language. And then from Manichaeism, you have another religion evolving around 300 AD that is what we now call the Roman Catholic Church. And that church is very mystical, and they believe in a feminine goddess. And then sometime later, around the 12th century, you have the emergence of the Kabbalah, which was the Jewish mystical form of this religion. And then later down the road, in the 1600s, around the time of the Reformation, you have the rise of a religion called the Rosicrucians. And then from the Rosicrucians, you have the rise of the Masonic Order. And from the Masonic Order, you have groups springing out like the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, which Aleister Crowley was a member of. And then from that, you have another group called the Theosophants, and Helena Blavatsky was one of the main leaders of that group. And then from Theosophy, you have a young lady coming out of that named Alice Bailey and started her own group. And Alice Bailey is now known as the mother of New Age religion. And so, although it has different names and takes different forms, it is the same religion. It is the religion of the rise of the Divine Feminine. 
So we see that this religion is constantly evolving, yet at the same time it stays the same. Which in of itself is fascinating how it can do that, but it can. And so we can see the last few evolutions of this religion, how it went from Theosophy with Helena Blavatsky into New Age Theology with Alice Bailey. Well, what was the next evolution and has it happened? Well, I think it has. The next evolution that this Mystery Babylon Divine Feminine Religion took was from Theosophy to New Age to the New Apostolic Reformation. Although it's not called New Age and it's not called Theosophy, it basically is the same religion in that it is mystical in nature, it is very sensual in nature, and it is very agreeable in nature. And then when this religion organizes itself into a physical body, it is marked by female leadership, a freedom from all boundaries. It doesn't tell anybody how to live. And then lastly, this group worships a feminine God that they call Holy Spirit. And this Holy Spirit that they worship is not the Holy Ghost of your Bible. Now, I know so far we have thrown a lot of information at you and we have made an astounding claim that modern Christianity, more specifically the New Apostolic Reformation and those around it, are the continuation of the Mystery Babylon religion. And many people will not be able to understand that. That will just, that's something they won't accept. But we have come to this conclusion through much prayer, much analysis, and through scriptural understanding of what the true biblical church is. And so the six points that we've given you about the mystery religion is that it is mystical, sensual, agreeable. Those are the inward traits of it. And then the outward manifestations of this mystery religion is female leadership, freedom from boundaries, and a feminine God. That's how you can recognize this crowd. And this mystery religion is the total antithesis of Bible truth. And I know that this religion tries to go to Christian concerts and involve itself in Christian ministries and conferences and things like that. The truth is, this is not Christianity. This is a, another evolution of Mystery Babylon religion, feigning Christianity, using the vocabulary of Christianity, and undiscerning people have no idea what the difference is. And so, biblically, let's examine this. Let's go through the inward points of the Divine Feminine and show you why this is not biblical. Now, the first point about the Divine Feminine is that it is mystical in nature. Now, mystical religion is based off of experience. It, it gets up in front of people and says, I had a vision that this was going on. And, and they'll, ex they'll explain some very elaborate, very oddly specific vision that they had. Uh, and, and it's very bizarre. And they'll, they'll base their religious views off of dreams and visions and things of that nature. Well, that's what mysticism is. Last night, I had a dream that there was a circle of women, there's about 50 of us, and we were saying, Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. Make it your cry right now. Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. My spirit was caught up over in Israel, and it wasn't just a dream, I was literally in Israel. A voice in your head? Is it a feeling? Is yeah. it through prayer? How does God speak to all you? All three of those things for sure. It's it's that's why I kind of with the idea of religion, I, I shy away from that. It's more my relationship with God is like no one else's, just like yours with you know, it's like God is so creative that I can't yes. impose what my belief and what my relationship that I have with him should be like chips or should be like yours. It's he shows up in beautiful, unique ways for all of us. And if you go back and look at like Alice Bailey, you'll see that she had encounters with an entity that she called a Hoot Kumi. 
and she said that this entity was an interdimensional being and came and spoke to her and that she actually wrote down the things that it said. Okay, the modern Christian churches are doing basically the same thing. Now, Bible Christianity is Bible-based. We get our teaching and our doctrine from the Bible. The Bible says in 2 Timothy 3.16, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. This is where we get our theology from. Now, the difficulty that the average churchgoer will have with this is that these false teachers will use the language of Christianity. They throw all that in there in the mix in an attempt to validate their views, but when you strip away all of the veneer of what they're saying, it is not Bible-based. The next aspect of the divine feminine is that it's sensual in nature. And the word sensual basically means that it's gratifying to your flesh. It feels good. And uh, that's what a sensual person is. And this religion is very sensual in that it wants to feel good constantly. It doesn't want anything out there that would make it feel bad about itself. It is overwhelmingly positive constantly. And it hates to feel bad, so it's seeking everything it can to feel good. Now, the book of Jude, verse 19, says that there'll be those in the end times who will separate themselves who are sensual, having not the Spirit. And that spirit word is capitalized. This is the Holy Spirit. And these sensual people are feeling good about God, but they're not even saved. Now, the book of James chapter 3, verse 15 talks about a wisdom. There's a, there's a way of thinking in this world that's not from God. And it says that this wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, and devilish. Now, this sensuality desires positivity constantly. It absolutely craves it. It has to have some sort of feel-good message constantly because that, that is the message of sensuality. Don't let anybody put you down and just love everybody. And what these people do often is they preach on the love of God because it makes them feel good. And their verse that they use often is 1 John 4, 8. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. And all they do is just quote that, the last three words in that verse, God is love. And they talk about God is love, God is love, God is love. And God is love. But this love is detached from Bible truth. And the deception here is that, yes, God is love, but these people love everything. They love God, they love their church, they love their pastor, but they also love sin too. It's not that these people love God, it's that they literally love everything. I think I'll cause controversy, but I think there's one flaw in the Bible. And that flaw is there is something impossible with God. It's impossible for you to be alone and unloved by God. This is possible. That's the impossibility. You're loved by God. And they claim to be loving people, sure, but they love everything, including the things that God hates. And they'll never preach on 1 John 2, 5, but whoso keepeth his word in him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we are in him. They'll never talk about how that this love is defined by Bible truth. It is a generic, sensual love that, of course, it loves God, but it loves everything. And these people would never preach on 1 John 2.15 where it says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. I want to tell you that the love of God has limits. It has boundaries to it. And they don't believe that. They believe God loves everything all the time, no matter what. And they say God is love, but they do not say, Love not the world. They, they don't understand that. It's all positive. It's never negative. Overwhelming, never ending, reckless love of God. Got some good friends of mine that have stopped by on the couch. We've got Chad, Justin, and Carl. <laughs> love you. I love you, man. I want you to know you're loved. I thank you so much. 
And they'll never use 1 John 3, 18. My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. So this love is detached from truth. Therefore, it's not love. It's just sensuality. Now, the last inner aspect of the divine feminine nature is that it is agreeable in nature, meaning that it can literally get along with anything. A word today that describes this is tolerance. And you hear so many people talking about tolerance today in that we need to get along with everything and because truth is subjective. Your truth and my truth may not be the same, but you know we can set all that aside and just unite around unity. But Pastor Carl Lentz is really uh, one of the most Christ-like people that I know. I noticed him being willing to associate with anyone and everyone on the same level, and I want to be more like that. There's a total different attitude on the part of Roman Catholic uh, leadership today uh, toward uh, me and my work and toward uh, the Protestants in general. No, I think it's good. I think we have dialogue, we have understanding. I can uh, now have uh, complete uh, fellowship with uh, Roman Catholic people and there are no barriers that existed uh, 10 years ago. I think all of that is to the good. Christians um, our relationship to one another should be one of unity and partnership and joy and trust and grace. Let's let that be the close-handed um, part here, and, and then let's begin to have dialogue around these secondary issues that tend to divide us. And the divine feminine absolutely abhors the idea of any separation from anybody. It wants to unite and get along with everybody. That's what makes it feel good. It's like this kumbaya religion. Everybody unite, get together. We can all work together. This is wonderful. That's the divine feminine. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, the apostle Paul gives this idea where he says in verse 15, what concord hath Christ with Belial? That's Baal worship. He's saying, you know, you Christian people can't go hang out with those pagans. It, it just doesn't work. And in verse 17, he says, Wherefore come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. They do not believe that because they believe that that is unloving because of its negative nature. He doesn't want to take away our fun. He wants us to take the things away that's hurting us and others and himself. That's it, man. He's not trying to take away your fun. Now, many times in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul tells us about false teachers and gives many warnings in that way. But he tells us how to deal with them in Romans chapter 16, verse 17. He says, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. He says, verse 18, For they are such as serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. So I want to tell you that these people, they have fair speeches, they're great speakers, but they deceive the hearts of the simple. And we are to mark them and avoid them, not embrace them and work with them. You see, it's the total opposite. But the divine feminine wants to embrace error. Now, we're not talking about reaching people with the gospel. We're not talking about that. We're talking about holding hands with heresy in an attempt to help the truth go forward. And when you do that, you don't help the truth. You hurt the truth. And it is the total antithesis of biblical separation from false teaching and false teachers. The divine feminine is agreeable in nature. So how does this modern form of Christianity line up with the outer aspects of the Mystery Babylon divine feminine? How does it line up? Well, of course, we gave you the three points. Female leadership, freedom from boundaries, and a feminine God. So let's go through those. It is obvious to me today that the modern church is being led and run by females. I mean, it used to be that there was like an occasional woman's conference, maybe once a year, but it's starting to look like almost every conference that's being had is a woman's conference. And we even have situations where churches are bringing Beth Moore in to be the main speaker. 
and they're bringing a man in to just provide music for the meeting. And all of it is marked by feminine leadership. Another way in which this is evidenced of feminine leadership in the church is in the Christian book industry. I mean, you go through these catalogs like I got right here. There's Sarah Young, who's a Christian Catholic mystic on the front page. And then, of course, there are some men in the mix, but you have overwhelming feminine. You have Beth Moore, you got Lisa Tierkirst, and uh, you got Sarah Young. I mean, they're just whole sections of women books here. I mean, you got a whole section of Joyce Meyer, Karen Amon, Sarah Young, Ruth Simmons, Christine Kane, Jen Wilkin, Beth Moore, another section of Joyce Meyer. And in this catalog, you got a whole section of Priscilla Shire, you got Beth Moore again, Jenny Allen, you got Sarah Young, Lisa Terkurst, and then a whole other section of just different study Bibles you can get. But once you get outside of all these Bibles, it's like overwhelmingly women theologians. In our Culture Talk segment, Sandra will be interviewing Lori Stewart, who will be talking about the rise of women in apologetics. Now, the Mystery Babylon religion is run by women, but Bible Christianity, the Lord specifically put it in the Bible that it's supposed to be led by men. 1 Timothy chapter 3, this is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth the good work. One that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. So the man is supposed to be the leader of the New Testament church. Paul even wrote a letter to Titus on the Isle of Crete, and he said in Titus 1.6, if any be blameless, the husband of one wife. And so it's, it's a man. It is a man that has to be the leader of the New Testament church. Verse number nine, holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and convince the gainsayers. The lead role in the New Testament church is the pastor, and it is designed to be a man. And the New Testament church was not designed to be led by female apologists. So what once was its own little corner where it was like women's Bible studies has now consumed the entirety of Christianity today, where we now have women led religion, which is not Bible-believing Christianity. Another aspect of the divine feminine religion is that when it organizes, there, there is no rules. It's, it's all subjective. And the modern church is emulating this in that they're saying, you know, God is love and it doesn't matter what you do with your body. It doesn't matter how you live. All it matters is that you come and you know God. And the only thing that really bothers them is what they call legalism or religiosity or any type of rule that would restrict you from doing whatever you want. Now, the Gnostics had the idea that the God of the Old Testament was a tyrant and he was a bad guy and we are moving away. They, they celebrated the New Testament because we, we're getting away from this tyrannical system that used to be in place and now we've been liberated into the New Testament. And that's what they said and that's how they talked. The modern church believes the same thing. It is the same exact idea. The only difference is instead of the God of the Old Testament being the one that we have a disdain for, it is the old-fashioned traditional church that they have the disdain for. Hey, haters. I hate to break this to you, but your day is done. Whatever people used to think holiness was, it just became a mess and a nightmare. See, we're done with the way you sling shame and blame in the face of anyone who doesn't say what you say and see what you see, read what you read. And really turned a lot of people off. We're sick and tired of your pervasive propensity to pick a fight and hide the light, nitpicking every single pixel of God's brilliant picture, seeing only your side in only black and white. Some of you grew up in really religious environments where, you know, God wasn't happy unless you were depressed, you know? It didn't even count as church unless you had to endure it. You need to move on past that. God is doing a new thing. I mean, lift your hands, lift your heart, be free in his presence. So scared to death of difference, shaking your fist in the face of change. Because holiness became not smoking, not drinking, not cussing, not dancing, not playing cards, not going to parties, not wearing pretty clothes, not wearing any, any makeup. You're full of opinions, but you're low on the spirit because the spirit 
is love. Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. You look like a toddler drawing lines in the sand, talking about how you're defending the truth. Fall back. It's a new day. But my desire tonight is that women actually give the Lord permission. Are you going to exchange your hate, trade the pain of the same, embrace a new way to change the world? Honor's time has come, and a new light has dawned. And we've been liberated. We have a new way now. That is how you notice these people. They don't want anybody telling them how to live. They don't want anybody saying that you shouldn't do this. Okay, you think about this for a moment. When is the last time you heard these people preach against sin? Standing for righteousness. Standing against the wickedness of our day. They don't do it. They get along with it. They love it. They work with it. They embrace it. They are fellowshipping with it because they are it. They are the same thing. They are just pretending to be Christians. This is the deceptive nature of Mystery Babylon religion. These people are not Christians. And what they believe is a total 180 of the Word of God. And these people love to talk about how free they are. They've been set free. But the question you have to ask yourself, they've been set free from what? What is it that you've been set free from? The truth is, these people have not been set free from sin. They've been set free from a system. And just like the Gnostics believed that the Demiurge, the God of the Old Testament, was a tyrant and his tyrannical theology held us captive and Jesus came to set us free from this tyrannical God of the Old Testament, these people believed the same thing in that these people were trapped by fundamental doctrine and we need to come out of that and be set free. And one of the buzz terms that they're using now is the word deconstruct. And famous Christian rapper, which there is no such thing, uh, Lecrae posted this on Facebook the other day, and he said, As a follower of Christ, I found it helpful to deconstruct some unhealthy views I've learned. The word deconstruct doesn't scare me. Christ's disciples were labeled as minim, a common term for those who, whose beliefs fell outside of normative Judaism. They deconstructed some of the common teachings of the day in order to see Christ's teachings clearly and factually. The religious leaders of the day did not like how they were deconstructing either. In the end, though, they were tearing down unhealthy, corrupt, and distracting teachings. Similarly, Many people today are deconstructing and their views fall outside the view of normative evangelicalism. I think it's a healthy process. If you're going to deconstruct, take your time. If you have friends who are deconstructing, don't panic. Be patient. Lastly, make sure after deconstruction, you begin to construct and build on the solid rock of Christ. And so what Lecrae is saying is that we were trapped in this system, and he's calling it normative evangelicalism and that we need to deconstruct or break out of this, which is exactly, this is Gnosticism. This is the Mystery Babylon religion. What Lecrae is putting on the screen is the occult. Alice Bailey spoke about a feminine, invisible force called Shambhala. And it's interesting to note that the Shambhala was actually the next Maitreya that was coming, and that is the name they're going to give to the Antichrist. But she said about the Shambhala force that the Shambhala force is destructive and ejective, inspiring new understanding of the plan. 
and that the Shambhala will bring about that tremendous crisis, the initiation of the race into the mysteries of the ages. And so when these people take a turn where they go into some weird views and they talk about deconstructing their faith, that lines up exactly with what Alice Bailey says happens when the Shambhala, the wicked spirit of New Age religion, comes into a person. And when a person begins to reject basic Bible doctrine and even starts saying how they're deconstructing their faith, they are embracing doctrines of devils. This is the occult. This is what they're doing. And this has nothing to do with music. Nothing at all. This is about who God is. This is about the Antichrist. This is about people dying and going to hell. This is satanic in nature. This is unbelievably evil. This man is an agent of Satan. This man is not a Bible-believing Christian. This man is a worker of iniquity. And people today are oftentimes using Galatians 5.1, Stand fast therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. And they're saying that we've been set free from all boundaries and rules. We've been set free from the law is what they're putting it. And they're saying that, you know, we have the Christian liberty now to do anything sinful. And they're saying, you know, let's go drink liquor because we have Christian liberty. But what they don't understand and what the Bible is teaching here is that you are now set free not to sin, but to serve the Lord and set free to do the will of God. And 2 Peter chapter 2 warns of these people. It says that these are wells without water, clouds that are carried with a tempest, to whom the midst of darkness is reserved forever. For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they lure through the lust of the flesh, through much wantonness. Those that were clean escape from them who live in error. And notice this right here. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption. So these people are talking about how they've been set free. They've got liberty now but they're not saved. And see, this is the type of stuff that Aleister Crowley was talking about when he said, do as thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. Just do whatever you want is, is the main tenet of New Age religion and theosophy and the occult. And modern Christianity is preaching the same thing. But the Bible-believing perspective and what the Bible clearly teaches is that God is holy and that God working in us will create some sort of holiness within us. And the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 4, 7, But God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. And if you want to find out who the sheep and the goats are in Christianity, just start preaching holiness. Start preaching against sin. Start preaching against wickedness. Start preaching against uncleanness and unrighteousness. And you'll find out real quick who's who. The Bible even says in the next verse, he therefore that despiseth, well, despiseth what? Holiness. He therefore that despiseth holiness, despiseth not man, but God, who hath also given unto us his Holy Spirit. These people tell on themselves and they reveal that they are not Christians because they want freedom from all boundaries. They are not interested in holiness. They're interested in lasciviousness. These people want to live however they want. And they even have the audacity to take the word Christian and add it onto their sin. You have Christian nightclubs, you have Christian beer, you have Christian rock and roll, Christian rap music, Christian death metal. These people don't want boundaries. They hate boundaries. And that's how they give themselves away. And the Lord had to deal with the church of Thyatira in Revelation chapter 2, where he says, Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants, to commit fornication, and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. So it was the woman preacher that called herself. It wasn't God that called her. She called herself into a leadership role of the church. And moral decay was the result. And it's because these people would not practice ecclesiastical separation and they would not uphold the office of a bishop being a man. And so because of that, Satan came in and it ruined the moral character of these people. 
Now the last aspect of this Mystery Babylon religion is that they worship a female goddess. There always is a feminine aspect to their deity. Now we see here in the book of Revelation, chapter number 18 and verse number 4, And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partaker of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. And so if you notice all the feminine pronouns here, come out of her, that you be not partaker of her sins, that you receive not of her plagues. So you see that there is a feminine aspect to the deity that they serve. Now, most people to say, well, okay, most of these churches believe in God the Father. So how how does that fit? Well, it's it's pretty simple. The modern church worships a female Holy Spirit. Hundreds of folks are going to come here to witness the Beyonce Mass, bringing together secular music and a religious message. Uh, we do have a community that is youthful and loving and looks to the world as a partner, not an enemy. I think Beyonce is a better theologian than many of the pastors and priests in our church today. That is not an exaggeration. that he was portrayed as a female for the sense of, in the Bible it always talks about how we're both made in his image, man and woman. It was the female, she said, God said, I had to come to you like this. Mackenzie Allen Phillips. <laughs> the Holy Spirit, the mother heart of God, will soothe you as well. Male is not the image of God. And all the women can say, praise God. Male and female is the image of God. I promise you, if you send her the Holy Spirit back, I will not get in the way. Who understands what is pleasing in your eyes, what is conformable with your commands, send her forth from your holy heavens, from your glorious throne dispatch her. Now, the idea of a female goddess is nothing new to the world. The original pagan trinity was Nimrod, Semiramis, and Tammuz. You have a father, a mother, and a son. And all of these false religions, one of the trinity, one of the major players in their godhead, is always going to be a feminine type entity. The Gnostics worshipped an entity named Sophia. And Manichaeism worshipped something called the, the Mother of Life. The Kabbalists worshipped 
It was a feminine Holy Spirit that they worshipped named Shekinah. The Rosicrucians also the Rosicrucians borrowed from the Kabbalah the idea of the Shekinah, and Albert Pike of the Masonic Order actually believed that God was both male and female. And then when it came to the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn with A.E. Waite, he talked about Shekinah. And then Helena Blavatsky from the Theosophists, she wrote that book, Isis Unveiled and the Secret Doctrine. She spoke of Shekinah often. And then when you get down to the New Age religion, well, they believe in what we call the, the Divine Feminine, which is what we're dealing with in this documentary. But the New Apostolic Reformation, and let me add, and others, because this list is growing every day. These people believe in something that they call Holy Spirit. They are calling this same concept, the Shekinah, Mother of Light, the Sophia, the Divine Feminine, they're now calling this the Holy Spirit. But it's not the Holy Spirit of God in the Bible. It is the feminine aspect of the Mystery Babylon religion. And literally all these people are doing is they are stealing the terminology of Christianity and just slapping the label on top of paganism and marketing it off as Bible Christianity. And this is how Satan works. He's always infiltrating. He's always imitating. This is satanic. This is deception. And if you don't know the Bible, you're going to go for that. And you're going to die and go to hell. It's time for you to wake up. This isn't a game. This is real. And you can live the rest of your life in this fantasy land of judge not and positivity and sweetness, but you're going to die and go to hell because what you believe is love detached from truth. You are mystical, sensual, and agreeable, and as that spirit inside of you is not the Holy Spirit of God. You believe in that. And that's why you believe in female preachers, and that's why you believe in freedom from boundaries, and you actually worship a female spirit, and you're calling it the Holy Spirit, but it's just in line with this crowd right here. This religion has been around forever. It is nothing more than the next evolution of the mysteries of Babylon, the pagan religion that started with Nimrod. And it's so amazingly clever, and it glories in hiding in plain view. And you don't even see it, oftentimes until it's too late. And a lot of people don't realize this. Michelangelo's painting, The Creation of Adam, that's up on the Sistine Chapel that we've all seen, and everybody says it's a priceless work of art. Well, a lot of people don't realize that Michelangelo was in this Gnostic category and he worshipped Sophia. And everybody likes to look at Adam. Everybody likes to look at the hand touching the finger of God. And everybody likes to look at that gray-headed man up there who's God. But nobody seems to catch who's under the left arm of God. That's her. That is Sophia. You see, you never saw that before. Yeah. That's how this works. It hides right in your face. And by the way, right next to Sophia, and God has his finger on his shoulder, is a child. And there you have it, right in front of your face, the pagan trinity, Nimrod, Semiramis, and Tammuz. It's been there the whole time, and you never caught it. This is not a game, ladies and gentlemen. This is serious business. At this point in this discussion, we have to ask the question, what is the end goal of Satan? What is he trying to do? Why, why all this effort? Well, we have to go right back to the very beginning. Satan wants to imitate God and infiltrate everything that he does. Satan has his own church. He has his own ministers. He has his own Holy Spirit, if I could put it that way. But he also is trying to usher in his own kingdom. And all of these groups are doing the exact same thing. They're taking the dualities of the world, the red and the blue, and they're trying to merge them together 
to make a perfect union and thus create a perfect world. And everything will be as one. Perfect harmony, a perfect world for everybody to live in. Many groups have different names for the same concept. A lot of New Age people believe that we are in the age of Pisces and we are now transitioning into the age of Aquarius and that it takes some time, but eventually everybody's going to lay down their differences and we're all going to come into a unified world together and it'll be just perfect harmony and that is the age of Aquarius. Those who practice Jewish mysticism as outlined by the Kabbalah, they believe in the Tikkun Olam, which is the perfect age where the world will heal itself and go back to a Garden of Eden-like state. And the Masons and the Rosicrucians and all of those people basically believed the same thing. They just called it something different. Now, the New Apostolic Reformation and these fringe charismatic groups that are writing all the music of today, they have another term for it too. It's called the Kingdom Now Theology. It's also called the Seven Mountain Mandate. We have been given a mandate and an opportunity to really step in, to give influence on a national and international level. So that's the mandate we have, is, is to raise up people that can infiltrate the systems to bring the reality of King Jesus, His presence, His power, His order, His government, His structure, His method of life, His method of, of honor, treatment of other peoples, uh, to bring that into nations. And that's the mandate we've been given. And there's a lot of Christian people that are very excited about this, especially the Kerry Jobs and the uh, and uh, all the the big name charismatic people are very excited about this woman getting into office. Not really just because she's a conservative, but because they view that this is another step forward in the fulfillment of something called the Seven Mountain Mandate. The Seven Mountain Mandate. This is what the Seven Mountain Mandate is. And they basically believe that Christians are going to infiltrate all levels of society and make the world a better place. And eventually the world's going to get better and better and better and better and better. And Jesus is just going to step off into the world. And, and they, use, they use phrases like ushering in the kingdom. We're ushering in the kingdom. And guys like Sean Foich that's doing those revivals out on the West Coast right now in the middle of Portland with all that, uh, all the uprisings going over there. He'll go right in the middle of that and just kind of do a, a Bethel singing and uh, charismatic worship out there and everybody's saying that this guy's doing a great work for God. Well really he's a part of the New Apostolic Reformation and they practice and believe that the seven mountain mandate will come to pass before Jesus comes to, to, uh, comes to rule and reign on this earth. And basically, it's, it's like a post-millennial idea is that the world is getting better and better and better, and we're going to take over the world through the influence of Christianity, through spiritual powers, and we're all going to unite and unify, and then we're going to usher in the kingdom of God onto this earth. And they call it the Seven Mountain Mandate, and they also call it the Kingdom Now Theology. But basically, what these people believe is that they're going to make the world a better place, and that it's going to get better and better and better and better, and that eventually Jesus will just step out. And these people don't realize it, but they are actually preparing the world for the Antichrist in the name of Christ. It's, it's astounding how blind these people are. I want to share as a foundation um, this vision the Lord gave me back in 2015. And what it was is this, this vision of a wave. And it just grew up out of the ocean and came up really big like this wave and came up on the seven mountains of influence. It was mountain after mountain were these waves. And then all of a sudden the waves turned into women. The waves turned into women. The waves turned into women. And I felt the Lord say, this is time. This is the time when women are gonna come into their place. If women, do not come into their place in this hour. You will not see the full multiplication, the full dominion, the full rule of my kingdom in the earth because it takes both male and female to model the, the existence of God, yeah. the, the manifestation of his presence in the earth. And the truth is that masculine energy has been the dominant energy for at least the last 5,000 years. And women have been, since the fall, 
one of the, the, the largest oppressed people group in the world, even to this day. All because the feminine energy has been suppressed. And the feminine energy has to come back. We need this, this balance, this equilibrium, equanimity between the energies. Even in the church today, mm -hmm. there is still some mindsets about women that have oppressed women and keeping them from their call instead of releasing them into their call. Really what that is, is not understanding heart of God. And whenever you're, you're interpreting the things of scripture, but you aren't, you aren't interpreting through the heart of God, you come to wrong conclusions. Yeah. When you're in a deceptive mindset, you think it's the truth, mm -hmm. right? So, so like men or even other women who have a wrong mindset are actually going to be oppressors, mm -hmm. not because they want to be, but just because of they the nature of what they're believing. <laughs> You have been so oppressed. You're a woman with gifts. You're a woman with calling. And, and you have been walking so humbly, too. And, and yet you feel so squashed. And every time that you step out to try to just be, it's like put down, oppressed. And how we have become ruled by the patriarchy. And God just wants you to know that he is with you and this is a new season for you and he's going to show you how to rise up in this season and you will bloom and blossom and you will fulfill your destiny. We can take our witchery back. We can take our sisterhood back. And so I'm telling you that the Buddhists are waiting for the Maitreya. The Theosophants are waiting for the Ascended Masters. The Jews who are still stuck in Jewish mysticism are waiting for the first Messiah. The New Age people are waiting for the age of Aquarius and waiting for a man, a Maitreya, to lead us into that age. And what's the common thread that they all have? Well, it's pretty simple. We all need to step out of this and we need to shift into this because this is where unity is. This is where the world is progressing forward, and this is how we're going to make the world a better place. It's all the same. Every bit of this is the same nonsense with a different name on the label. And so what the occultist and many of the New Age people believe is that the masculine energy has dominated the world for far too long, and the feminine energy has been suppressed and pushed down. And when we talk about the rise of the Divine Feminine, what they want is this feminine energy to rise up and merge with the masculine. And when that happens, everything will be right. And some of you are looking at that saying, well now wait a minute, I've seen that before. Yeah, you have. Now, let me take you to an aspect of this that I really don't want to talk about. And as we get into this, you'll see why. This is probably the wildest thing I've ever studied or seen or really come to know ever in my life. We've, we've shown you how the occultic world, their goal is to merge back what God has divided. And we told you over and over again on this channel that God is a divider and Satan is a uniter. And many people have, have sent me emails over that, but it's true. God is a divider. Satan is a uniter. And I want to just bring this graphic up because this is what these people are teaching and this is what they believe. They talk about the divine feminine and the divine masculine. And they say that how these energies need to be brought into balance in order to achieve what they call the world peace or the perfect world that they want to go to. This is what is often referred to as alchemy. And you see this symbol a lot. Uh, for example, we'll just pull up the Theosophant symbol. Uh, if you notice there, there's a snake and it's, it's basically eating its tail. And then also you have the divine masculine feminine stars there in the middle, which actually is the star of Rimfram, which is what Israel uses. Uh, you have in the middle, you have the, the cross and the Ankh there, which that is the Egyptian version. 
of the divine masculine, the divine feminine. Uh, the masculine is the cross, and the loop on the top is the feminine, and the merger of the divine masculine and divine feminine. That's what that symbol means. And then also uh, you have the the Om from Hinduism, and uh, then you also you have this symbol right here uh, from Buddhism that is not from Germany. That is actually a Buddhist symbol, and the, the Germans in 1930 actually stole that from them and borrowed that. And so the theosophy basically is the merger of all of these religions into one. Martial arts, you have the yin and yang, which is a merger, a duality being brought together. And then also you have things like this is a tarot card, and this is the magician tarot card. And if you see there on the top, he has the infinity symbol because he is a perfectly balanced being. These symbols are found all throughout history. I want to tell you that the Hindu world is actually looking for a perfectly balanced being. And uh, they call him the Adi Yogi, and there's a lot of people there that are looking for a reincarnation of, of, of Shiva and are saying that this, this creature back here behind it, this big statue, is, uh, is going to be male and female. He'd be the perfect teacher for all the world. This is the Adi Yogi, the, the reincarnation of the one who started yoga. And, uh, and there's just so much going on there. And actually, you're even talking about uh, Shiva and Shakti back where, I believe it was Pav Pavarati, that she merged with Shiva and became the perfect being, man and female. And this this is the goal of, of all these occultic religions, the mystery religion. And they, they actually even teach that Adam and Eve in the garden before God created Eve from the rib of Adam, that Adam was a hermaphrodite creature. That, these people believe that and they teach that. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to get back to that. They want that, and they're they're seeking and desiring that. I want to show you guys this. This is the symbol that we've shown a lot in this documentary. This is called the Rebus, and this is actually a symbol of alchemy. And if you notice, this creature has a head of a man and a head of a woman. This is a duality that has been merged. And uh, the symbol above them is actually the uh, as a golden star. It's actually a symbol of the age of Aquarius. There is a sun. There is a moon. And then also, if you notice here, notice what's in their hands. There's there's this symbol going down, and there's this symbol, kind of a pyramid going up like that, and one going down. Okay, so uh, this this symbol is actually what the Masons, the Masonic Lodge have, they have the same symbol. The uh, You see the feminine on the bottom, and then you see the masculine on the top, and in the middle of that, that G stands for the Grand Architect, which they is their God. And the Masons are not Christians. Please do not ever think that the Masons are Christians. They're just not. So what you have here is the Rebus symbol, and notice what's in their hands. you got the, the masculine and the feminine all brought into perfect balance, and that's what the Masons believe. That's their religion. But in this rebus, I want you to notice there's so much here. The RE, and then there's an IS over here. Um, the RE stands for Ra, and the IS stands for Isis. And these are the Egyptian names of Nimrod and Semiramis. Re being Ra, and Isis being uh, Semiramis. And Re is actually Nimrod and then Semiramis there. And what you have is Re or Ra be Isis, or you can play it backwards, Isis be Ra. It's a merger of genders, and it is a duality that is fixed, and this is actually the perfect end-all be-all of all the occult. This is the perfect androgynous, perfectly balanced being. This is the goal of all this. And so let me just, I want to connect a dot for you, and I really don't want to even say this. Please Please, I beg your forgiveness before I even say this. This is this is so unbelievable to me. Uh, but if you notice, as you get into this stuff and you see all of these contemporary artists, these these way out there, New Apostolic Reformation people, all the the Hillsong Bethel elevation, which I think is the unholy trinity of false worship in the end days, the people that are running this are androgynous. They are men with long hair, and oftentimes there are women with very short hair. And not only that, a lot, a lot of these people, a lot of these men that are singing these songs are very effeminate, are very womanly, if I could put it that way. This is how you can tell these people are into the occult. The men become women, and the women become men. There's something wrong with these people. 
something very wrong with these people. And it's not about skinny jeans and it's not about the hair. It's about what's going on inside of these people. These people have taken on a spirit. These people have have experienced something and are going a direction that is not towards the Bible. It is going away from the Bible and away from everything godly and right and holy. That's the issue. So you see these effeminate men and these masculine women, and it seems like they're all merging into one gender. It's so bizarre. It's almost, it's almost unspeakable to even say this. But that is the end game of the occult. We will never be able to usher in the age of Aquarius unless we give up all divisions, including gender. Acts 2.14 says, In the last days I'm going to pour out my spirit on, help me, all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Even upon your bond servants will I pour out my spirit and they shall prophesy. Revival doesn't have a gender. Revival doesn't have a gender. Revival doesn't have a gender. You see, and that's why that... Paul told the church of Corinth it was shameful for a man to have long hair. And that's why he said, you know, some of you were effeminate. And then you got saved and you came out of that. Because Bible Christianity is the total opposite of this. And if you notice the people get into this, there's, there's this blending that happens in every area of their life. They blend. It's bizarre. But it happens it's because they've taken on the spirit of this world. And I hate to even say it because I know it would just it, it's going to devastate so many people, but this symbol right here that I hold in my hand, this statue that many Americans love and adore, this was given to us by Western European Freemasons. And if you'll notice, this is the body and hair of a woman and the face of a man. This is Semiramis. This is her. And she hides right out in plain view, and you never see her. This is a picture of the perfect androgynous being. They are moving to get a perfect world, making the world a better place. And ultimately, it becomes such a grand place, we'll go into a perfect age. And they're going to have a perfect leader step out. And he will claim to be God himself. And that's the whole point of the Third Adam series. Satan is trying to create his own millennial kingdom, his own Garden of Eden. And if you're not careful, he'll pull you into it as well. Everything that God does, Satan imitates. And Satan right now is trying to usher in his own millennial kingdom with his own world leader, the Antichrist. And as he attacks women to rise up and take your place as equal with the man, which is called the rise of the divine feminine, it causes three things to happen. It causes disorder, it causes dysfunction, and it causes destruction. And in order for Satan to usher in this new age, the values of the past have to be demonized and destroyed. Now, we see this happening all throughout the world today. We see people calling for the end of patriarchy. And all that is is just a straw man that they're going after. But what they really are trying to do is destroy biblical values in a society. This has nothing to do with politics. Everything about this is spiritual in nature. And so for the new world to come in, the old world has to be destroyed. And we see here in the order that God has created, how that Christ is head of the man, man's head of the woman, woman's head of the children. When a woman steps out of that, that causes disorder. God has a plan and an order, and women are a major part of that. And if you take women out of the equation, the whole thing crumbles. And that's not demeaning to women at all. I don't know where you get that. that. That's a lie from hell. That is not demeaning to women at all. It shows that women have the utmost value in the eyes of God. Stop believing these insane lies of feminism that women are subservient or you are put down. 
That's not true at all. That is a lie from hell. You have tremendous value. Tremendous value. And that's why God protects you like He does. And so when a woman steps out of that and goes into an occultic worldview, disorder is caused. And secondly, that disorder brings dysfunction into the lives of people. I want you to see what's on the board behind me. We have God's structure. This is God's order. Christ head of the man, man head of the woman, woman's head of the children. And what I've done is I put a blue arrow for leading and then a red arrow for submitting. And really all relationships in life are built on submission and leadership. All of them are. And what I want you to see is that as Christ leads the man, there is a natural submission that has to happen. You can't have one without the other. These two are together. And so as a man leads his family, there is a natural submission that his family has to follow him as he follows Christ. And as the woman leads the children, the children are to submit to that and uh, submit to their parents as unto the Lord. And you see here, this is God's order. The man is to submit to Christ and the woman is to submit to man as he submits to Christ. And the children are supposed to submit to their parents as unto the Lord. And this is God's plan here. This is God's order. And I want you to notice that in this side right here, that Christ can be seen by the children. And there is a, there is a communication line there. Uh, these children can see Christ and these children uh, can come to understand who Christ is and to see who Christ is. But what I want you to see on this side of, of the equation is that what if the woman says, nope, nope, I'm done with this. I, I will be above the man and equal with the man. And now she starts trying to lead the man. And then eventually, if that, if that dynamic is how it is, then the man has to submit to the woman and this right here causes absolute chaos because what happens next is is that the children start to lead the family and then the family starts to submit to the children. And next, next thing you know, you have a home run by the kids. And then also, I want you to see this, that man tries to be in leadership of God and really tries to control God. If you don't think that's happening, I want to tell you it is. And I want to tell you right now that this right here, God will never go for that. God is not led by man. He's Lord. He will not be controlled by men. When there is dysfunction in the order of God, Christ is cut from the equation. You cannot be right with God unless you are within the parameters of God's order. You just can't be. And in Isaiah chapter 3, verse 12, the nation of Israel got into this Babylonian mindset and they got into this occultic mindset. And the Bible says that children were their oppressors and women ruled over these people. It was all backwards. There was disorder and that disorder caused dysfunction in the lives of these people. Now on this side, I want you to see that Christ is able to be seen by these children. But on this side where there's dysfunction, I want you to see here that this never happens. And so this is part of the Antichrist plan because for him to usher in his kingdom, to usher in his Antichrist, his one world government, he has to raise up a generation of children who know not the Lord. He has to destroy this structure here in order to have his followers and have a generation that will go for his agenda. This has to happen. And so he creates disorder in the home. He goes after the women, just like he did in the Garden of Eden. And as these women shift into an occultic mindset, that disorder leads to dysfunction, as you see right here. And that dysfunction eventually leads to destruction. And as Satan is trying to turn the tide, if you will, as he's trying to push the whole world into a shift to embrace a satanic worldview, in order for him to do that, Christianity has to be weakened. And you see now that modern churches are becoming so apostate, so worldly, that they're almost laughable. And this has been his plan all along. And so the shift will happen on a major scale. I believe that to be the grand delusion of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And I believe that these people by the billions are going to go for this. The third Adam is coming. 
if not already here. And He is preparing the way for His coming by creating a generation of cursed children who were raised in dysfunctional homes that were not able to see Christ. And as 2 Peter 2.14 says, these cursed children, these are the ones who will follow the Antichrist. The disorder will bring dysfunction, and out of that dysfunction will come destruction. For the first time in American history, less than 50% of the American population is going to church. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, it's happening. Destruction is coming. And it's time that you wake up. I've had a lot of people ask me if I thought that the Antichrist would be some sort of trans type person or LGB whatever type person. And I understand where they're coming from. They're using the verse in Daniel chapter 11 verse 37 where he said, Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor regard any God, for he shall magnify himself above all. And they're talking about how that has no desire of women in that verse and the actual wordage that he uses there is that, uh, nor the, the desire of women. And they try to imply all kinds of things about you know, what he is on a personal level. But I don't know if that necessarily has to do with that. I think really if you cross-reference that to Genesis chapter 3, verse 16, the first mention of the word desire in the Bible, and it says in Genesis 3, 16, uh, upon the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception and sorrow Thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. I think that the word desire has to do with the order of God for all of us, really. And I think it has to do with that chart that I showed you. When any of us, not just women, but with any of us, step outside of the order that God has given us, then it becomes very bad very quickly. And anything, even a good thing, that is not in its right place, it can, it can become a bad thing very quickly. And I hope you understand that. I want to give you an illustration real quick. I've got sitting here on the ground a, a glass of water. And, uh, you know, who doesn't like a nice clean glass of water? But if I take this water and I drink it and it goes down into my stomach, it becomes a good thing. It's a great thing. But if I drink it and, and uh, it's, it goes down the wrong pipe and goes into my lungs instead of my stomach, then it, really it's not where God intended it for it to go. It's out of its place and it becomes a very destructive force very quickly. I, I'm not sure, but I think that just that amount of water right there could drown somebody if poured directly into their lungs. So a good thing becomes a bad thing because it's not in the place that God intended for it to be. And this is, the, this is the design of Satan. This is what he does. He attacks the order of God upon people because he knows that if he can cause disorder, then he can cause dysfunction. And if he can cause dysfunction, then he can cause destruction. That's his plan. For Satan's world to come in, this world now has to go. And you're seeing a shift right now in politics, in entertainment, in every area of the world. This shift is designed, just as Satan did in the Garden of Eden, to attack women and to bring destruction upon the world, destroy this world and build his new world on top of it. That's his plan. It's just that simple. And I want to encourage you today if you are not born again, you are not within the order of God, you're not in Christ, you're not quickened with Christ, you need to get saved today. And if you're not within a local church, then you're outside the order of God. You're outside of that. And being outside of God's order brings dysfunction and destruction in your life. 
use our website, independentbaptist.church, to find you a good local church. And if you're a Christian husband, you need to be within the order that God has given you. You need to be submitted to Jesus Christ, leading your family to be a Christian home. I meet so many women that are they're, they're, just, they're taking their kids to church by themselves and the woman's got to lead the home spiritually because some, some man who's not doing what God wants him to do is just causing disorder, dysfunction, and destruction in his own family because he's not submitted to Christ. And I think if we can just get that right, I think everything else really will take care of itself. You know, when you make a video like this, people, I'm sure, will, <laughs> will accuse you of being some, some ridiculous he-man, woman-hater type thing and, you know, women need to be in the kitchen and all that kind of stuff. And, and that's, that's not been the spirit of this video. It's not been the intent of this video. But the intent is to show you the tactics of Satan, how that Satan loves, just like he did in the Garden of Eden, he loves to go after women. And he loves to bring disorder, which causes dysfunction, which causes destruction. And I don't know about you, when I watch a video like this, I think, oh God, help me to be what I'm supposed to be for you. Help me to be what I'm supposed to be for you. And I think for me that means leading my family spiritually and leading them to know Christ. And I'm going to ask God to help me do that. Thank you for watching this video. We love you. And God bless you. I think I'm going to go be a good Christian dad now. <laughs>